Okay, so thank you for coming to my talk about electronic structure calculations in qubit space using a quantum annealer. You know, we're very excited to be giving you this presentation today, even though we're all socially distanced. And you know, from myself and OTI, we hope you are all doing well. Um, but it's first important to start off with what OTI Lumionics is uh, doing and why we're interested in uh, com uh, computational chemistry and materials discovery. So at OTI Lumionics, we develop advanced materials for OLEDs. Mainly this manifests through our, our material product line of the conductor uh, cathode patterning material. And this material is important because it allows highest transparent displays of OLEDs. Um, so this is a 17 inch AM OLED that we actually fabricated ourselves uh, last year. And you can see that we're actually using, and this actually contains our conductor material, and this is, we're able to actually have very high transparency through these materials, higher than other available technologies. Even currently, all of our materials are still within, are basically finalizing their mass production testing. And so we expect that they'll be uh, shipped out at the end of this year and maybe start appearing in some of these devices uh, early next year. To give a bit of a background, what is an OLED? So an OLED is effectively, it's a chemical sandwich. We have these organic materials which emit light and conduct electrical charge, and they're sandwiched between two electrodes. These materials, they're only really nanometer or micron thick. And so the quantum mechanical effects of these uh, light emitting materials and even the charge transport materials are really important in determining the overall performance of an OLED. So how OTI Lumionics actually goes about its work is we're able to do uh, basically do in-house end-to-end -end testing for materials all the way from concept discovery to production testing in our miniaturized uh, mass production line. So you know, we can do materials discovery, which involves product specification, uh, concept, and we can go to quantum simulations. We can do the synthesis and scale up. We can even bring the materials in-house and test them in a lab. Well, what makes OTI fairly unique within a lot of OLED materials kind of companies is that we actually do have a mass production line. And so we're actually able to test these materials in OLEDs, but not just one-off OLEDs, actually by making hundreds of these OLEDs and testing their reliability. So our approach to materials discovery is somewhat unique in that we're able to basically specify a list of properties. So for OLED materials, you know, we're interested in things like vapor pressure, optical constants, et cetera. And basically through a combination of computational chemistry, machine learning, and production testing, we're able to propose a, uh, a set of, a small set of candidate materials that then we can go and synthesize and provide to our customers. And so right now we actually do all of this on our high performance computing cluster in house using uh, CPUs and GPUs. Uh, well, one of the things that makes our thing a little bit unique is that we're able to transfer all the information from production testing, machine learning, computational chemistry, and back again. But one of the things that we're really interested in and that we've been exploring um, in collaboration with D-Wave is whether we can use quantum computers to actually do some of these calculations and what are the particular benefits of doing quantum chemistry simulations or machine learning on quantum computers. You know, even if there is a potential speed up, is that speed up necessarily enough to offset the cost? And these are kind of the questions that we're actually interested in. Um, since I know that not everyone's an expert in quantum chemistry here, I thought I would just give a high level overview of what quantum chemistry is. So all quantum chemistry, uh, similar to a lot of other quantum mechanics, is that we're trying to solve the Schrodinger equation. Now, specific to quantum chemistry, uh, when we say quantum chemistry, we mean the electronic structure calculation, which is really how the electrons behave around a molecule. How do they move from one orbital to another orbital? Where are their general locations? And what is the overall energy of the molecule? So in this case, you know, we have H, which is the electronic Hamiltonian. And, you know, we're interested in where the nuclear positions are. Um, and where the electron, relative electron positions are as well. So in quantum chemistry for quantum computers, though, traditionally the Hamiltonian is converted into this second quantization form, which has these uh, ladder, fermionic ladder operators. One thing that is a bit distinct from quantum chemistry on a quantum computer is that we actually start from what we consider molecular orbitals or uh, Hartree-Fock orbitals, and even in some cases, you can actually start from the Consham orbitals. So it's important to recognize that there, before we even get quantum chemistry on a quantum computer, we've already done calculations on a classical computer. Now, these cal classical calculations like Hartree-Fock or DFT, they're relatively straightforward and can be done to very large molecules. It's usually trying to incorporate the either the correlation energy or the exchange energy in that last mile to get the best accuracy, which really makes quantum chemistry difficult. 
really where the quantum chemistry on a quantum computer really got its lift was from, from this invention of the variational quantum eigen solver, which is a hybrid algorithm for the NIST quantum era. And it was really a critical algorithm in actually allowing people to do any sort of quantum chemistry on a quantum computer. So what, what it starts off with is you start off with a qubit Hamiltonian, a wave function on site, some initial control parameters, which are just basically phases in a rotation gate. And we hand that off to a quantum computer for the energy evaluation by sampling it. And so then from the calculating the expectation value of these wave functions acting upon this qubit Hamiltonian, we basically can then feed that answer into a classical optimizer, which can then update these, uh, these control parameters. And we basically repeat this until convergence. But it's important to describe what are the current barriers to quantum computing. Even though a lot of people are simulating larger and larger systems on a quantum computer, we often notice that the systems are actually fairly similar. You know, we're doing larger and larger chains of hydrogen. And that's while that's interesting from a operational or that it can be done perspective, it's not really applicable to the industry. Like chains of hydrogen are not really used are not really simulated within particularly OLEDs at all. So before we can even start saying that we're going to discover all the drugs or we're going to discover all materials, you know, we should really start to check at what are the problems? Why can't, you know, even with Google's 53 qubit quantum computer or even IBM's recent uh, 60 plus qubit quantum computer, why aren't they able to simulate OLED materials to high precision? So really one of the problems is that with, current quantum algorithms is that two qubit gate counts scale very poorly with molecule size. When you take something like lithium hydride, it requires to get, to get to the accuracy that we want from a theoretical perspective. We need something, or at least originally with the unitary coupled cluster on sauce, we need something like 272 to 8,711 CNOT gates, which requires a fidelity, a CNOT fidelity, which has never been reported. The other problem is that almost all these algorithms require qubit to qubit connectivity on a universal quantum computer. And if we take something like Rigetti's Aspen qubit topology, we can notice that qubits aren't even remotely all fully connected. And this is true for Google's quantum computer, and this is true for IBM's quantum computer. That NISC era quantum chips just do not have that full connectivity. The other one is that they really lack qubits for practical problems. So like something like an ALQ3, which is a uh, very early on OLED uh, green fluorescence emitter, requires something in the neighborhood of 100 qubits to simulate properly. And really, you know, simulating chains of hydrogen is interesting from an academic perspective, but it's not interesting from an industrial perspective. So like what are, you know, we can already run DFT simulations. We can already run even uh, some MP2 simulations, which can capture a lot of uh, quantum phenomenon and correlation that we're interested in. So really, where does, why go to this effort of using quantum computers and why even go to the effort of running these simulations to like, where is the current applications where that high level precision is needed for industry? But uh, we're going to back up and explain kind of why CNOT gates don't scale very well. Uh, so the unitary couple cluster, since it starts off with basically these uh, cluster operators in a summation form, and that needs to be trotterized. So a very simple fermionic operator ends up becoming a very lengthy combination of polyterms, and this results in a very lengthy qubit depth. So one of the things that we invented first is that we invented something called the qubit couple cluster method. And so the qubit couple cluster method produces very short, compact quantum circuits. And we did this by basically saying, well, let's bypass the problems of the unitary couple cluster and let's just basically create new entanglement sequences and evaluate them on a case by case basis. So we can basically construct a product of entang potential entanglement gates. And so the qubit couple cluster protocol is Basically, it's, it's a fairly straightforward protocol. Basically, what we're looking at is for a given generator or entangler, PK, we want to consider its contribution to the energy minimization. And basically, that means what we do is we're going to basically evaluate how much does this, this candidate entangler lower the energy. And then we're only going to actually put onto the quantum computer the ones that contribute the most. 
So what we do is basically we run a first order test and pick up those with non-zero value. We can run a second order test that's a little bit more complicated, but the first order test is usually sufficient. And so once we generate that first order list, we can basically sort it by modulus or gradient to form a final set. This could still be relatively difficult because it does require some reoptimization as we go through it. But the first derivative calculation is actually relatively straightforward as described by this equation. It can be done very reliably on a classical computer. But that wasn't necessarily enough to address the problem with a full to full connectivity requirements and to even compress the circuit depth even further. So what we invented is this iterative qubit couple cluster method. And so this reduces even the qubit connectivity requirements and it even reduces the circuit depth forward. And so what we do is basically for a candidate, for a entangler, after we actually just embed that single entangler onto a quantum computer, we optimize it, and then we fold in that result back into the Hamiltonian to generate a new Hamiltonian. So for example, if we had this candidate entangler of x1, x2, y3, y4, we would have to entangle qubits one to four. We would basically generate a gate sequence from that entangler, we would optimize it, and we would reintegrate it back into the Hamiltonian. Then for the second iteration, let's say that we have this uh, poly operator, which is z1, z2, x5, x6. One of the advantages is that we can reshuffle the qubits around. So then now actually we can connect qubit five and six in order and leave qubit three and four because they're not acted upon by the entangler. Each new iteration is a new quantum circuit. So basically the indices can be uh, rejigged between iteration. So another way is to visualize this um, again as an algorithm. And so we have this Hamiltonian in onsets. We do a VQE optimization of a small section of the onset. We integrate that optimize onslaught into the Hamiltonian, we repeat until converge. So for example, some results using just a symmetric stretch of water, you know, we can get um, QCC energies with even with very low gate depth that can be very close to the exact energy, particularly at equilibrium geometries. And one of the interesting things is that when we apply this method, such as ranking the entanglers and optimizing under certain circumstances, particularly with stretch geometries or geometries that are very difficult, uh, that would natively be very difficult for a normal quantum chemistry program to actually simulate, you can actually notice that QCC, because it encounters all types uh, from at least a theoretical standpoint, QCC, because it's abstract, generated in qubit space, it actually incorporates even higher order excitation operators, which is something that UCC uh, doesn't actually do natively. And so in some fairly niche cases, but interesting cases, at least from a stretch geometry perspective, um, UCCSD actually does not provide chemical accuracy. And this is important because what it means is it means that QCC is a very robust black box method, which is important from an industrial standpoint. So our IQCC method, you know, it also enables shallower circuits to be optimized individually, allows circuits to scale linearly with qubits, and it requires a lower qubit connectivity. However, you know, even with, uh, with these advances, um, you know, for universal gates, quantum computers such as IBM Q or Google, you know, we're really looking at about 20 to 54 qubits that are not necessarily fully connected. Whereas with the D-Wave, you know, you can get up to 2048 and even in, uh, even I think even soon we're able to get up to about 5,000 qubits. And even with the hybrid solvers, we can get even much larger than that. So in order to really simulate large problems, we need a lot of qubits. Um, so, the, you know, one of the things that we started off earlier was, well, you know, all this stuff is interesting, but could we develop a a quantum solver for quantum chemistry on the quantum annealer. One of the things that we uh, developed, at least theoretically, was this qubit transformation and domain folding. And so what this allows us to do is this allows us to take the blotch angles of our qubit Hamiltonian and actually then convert it into an Ising form, where the Ising form is really done to help speed up the optimization of uh, these electronic structure calculations. And so some of the results which we're you know, very excited to show today are fairly new. And we want to, you know, we hope that these cases, as we further investigate them, they'll at least provide kind of the initial sampling of where we really expect this method to really yield benefits. One of the things that we've invented is we've invented this new technique called parameterized quantum annealing, which is similar to the variational quantum eigenstall, right? We have a qubit Hamiltonian. We have an onslaught that we propose, and we have a bunch of initial control parameters. And basically, what we do is we feed that into the D-Wave for energy and configuration sampling, um, which then provides us with an energy. 
And that energy we then feed back up into a classical optimizer and we keep updating these parameters and we repeat it until convergence. And what this allows us to do is because we have so many more qubits to play with, we're able to actually now start to simulate materials like uh, such as these OLED materials, you know, from LIQ all the way to ALQ3. So some of the preliminary results that we've uh, obtained you know, simulating nitrogen at equilibrium geometry is one thing that we've confirmed because nitrogen is a relative to the smaller system, we've been able to confirm that using the idealizing machine and using the D-Wave, statistically speaking, there's really no difference in the benefit that they provide. Um, however, when you don't use an ising machine in this optimization, we can notice that the number of optimization steps is quite large, significantly more. So what this helps confirm is this helps confirm that the D-Wave and the idealizing optimizer, uh, our ising machines are basically enabling us to do fewer classical optimization steps. And we're hoping that this results in a tangible benefit to the optimization process. One of the interesting things is that sometimes with fairly complicated systems like nitrogen, um, the D-Wave actually enables us to reach the true ground state. Because what happens when you don't have an Ising solver or you don't have a, when you don't have an Ising solver in this case, is that the normal optimization can get trapped in a, a local minima and not actually be able to find the global minima. So that's really important in the way that we've reformulated this problem because the Ising solver enables us to actually basically achieve the true ground state. But one of the more interesting results is this iridium complex, IRPPY3, and you know, we're able to accurately calculate the triplet energy, the triplet uh, singlet gap energy, and it corresponds very well with experimental values. Uh, but one of the interesting things that we've observed and we've measured is that actually after, you know, because ICQCC goes through a set of iteration, each iteration is classically optimized. Um, what we notice is that when we use the D-Wave and we only use it every 10th classical optimization, and in this case, the problem is too big to use an idealizing solver. It's 56 qubits, we can't actually solve that. It's classically intractable. Um, we can solve it using the D-Wave hybrid system. Um, what we actually notice is that despite the time spent in Q and also all the time that we have to spend reformulating the problem so that it can actually fit on the D-Wave. The D-Wave actually reduces the number of iterations so significantly that we actually measure a speed up in time. And it's not a significant speed up, but it's a reliable speed up. And so what that implies is that implies that, you know, even though we're sitting in Q with a bunch of other people who want to also use the D-Wave, we're actually able to realize an industrial benefit here and that we can reduce the time that this calculation would take to do if we did not have the D-Wave. And that's really what I think is one of the more profound uh, observations or at least uh, uh, results that we've obtained to date. So where do we really see near-term applications for quantum computing? So what kind of, you know, chains of hydrogen are interesting, but I guess from a physics standpoint, but not really from a chemistry or from a, an industrial standpoint, and particularly not even from, an, uh, definitely not from an OLED perspective. Uh, so what kind of commercially relevant problems, you know, is OTI interested in as a, as a commercial entity? You know, one of the things that matters to us is cation, ant, triplet, and excited states. One thing which is usually not even really talked about within the quantum computing community for chemistry. So, you know, we have ALQ3 here. If we look at the charged cation, when we actually use classical methods, um, it actually can be quite difficult to optimize. Even the initial hartree fock calculation can be relatively difficult and requires a lot of fine parameter tuning. However, with quantum methods, even if we don't necessarily put in the correct uh, hartree fock state as the baseline, we actually can get still recover the correct answer. The other one which is really important is this uh, reaction chemistry. Recent, you know, recent studies have shown that basically with a lot of catalysts or uh, chemical reactions that we're interested in, uh, you would actually need to uh, pick a different DFT functional per stage in the reaction in order to get it to be actually correctly optimized. And that's a significant problem from a black box perspective. Really where we see quantum computing being very helpful in our industry is really with complex charge states potential energy surface diagrams. And this implies that, you know, we're gonna be designing catalysts and materials with complex transitions. I wanna thank you for coming and listening to my talk and uh, I hope to answer any of the questions that you may have. Thank you so much.